So I've been thinking for the past several days about Dune Part 2, and I think we have a problem. But it might not be one that you actually think it is. That's right, you have big time Dune fan here, Mr. Z. My name is Z from Our Reviews Will Kill You, and I'm here to talk again about Dune. I told you I was going to make Dune videos, and I made a bunch of them. So here's one more, and this one I want to thank our fans here at Our Reviews Will Kill You, because I think you guys made the best point of all. I'm going to show you what professional writers who get paid for writing reviews say about it, and then we're going to talk about the real problem, because this was kind of a plot hole. That was There was something chewing at me in the back of my mind as I was watching this. And I was like, something isn't right here. So I think the big thing that most people have come away with is it's a great movie, very close to being a masterpiece, yet there's some problems here. And one of the problems is Zendaya, not as much Timothy Chalamet, but, but the two leads don't necessarily drive home how great the source material is and what we have is people complaining that zendaya is the girl boss of girl bossing and they they deliberately changed it and that's the least likable thing and maybe it's not her fault as an actress but it is the director's fault denis villeneuve so let's look at some articles to see why dune f fails these are real people writing real things. Ann Arton writes, Why Dune Part 2 fails to address Dune's biggest issue. It's not a critique of colonialism. It's an example of it. Oh, okay. Because, you know, colonialism didn't help anybody ever. Few directors have as much respect in the industry as Denis Villeneuve. His filmography makes something of a living legend. Arrival, Sicario, Prisoners, Blade Runner, 2049. Blade Runner, <laughs> they're all very beautiful to look at. Uh, so, yeah, apparently there's hypocrisy built into Dune because, you know, all the visual brilliance, it's not, it doesn't critique colonial is, colonialism bad enough because it's evil, Right? The movie is about the destruction of Mina-coded Middle Eastern North African community. Right. Uh-huh. And they're like they're saying like, "Oh, Anya Teller-Joy rocks up to a carpet in a makeshift hijab." I don't know that that's what she's wearing. Just because she's wearing a crazy outfit like, doesn't make it yours. You don't own whatever nonsense she's wearing. Uh, Muslim women are around the world are fighting against ridicule and legislation that strips them of their autonomy to wear hijabs. What about the ones who get killed for not wearing them? No, not a thing. Pretty sure that happened. Don't care that much. Your opinion is stupid, digital spy people. Let's talk about another <laughs> big-time offender. Now, I don't necessarily always pick a fight with this guy, Eric Kane. He's also a YouTuber, freelance writer. The five biggest problems with Dune. He actually picked a pretty big fight in True Detective with one of the lead actresses and got into a giant Twitter war, which uh, Twitter is for dummies. If you're on Twitter flaming people, you are trying to get attention, and no one cares about your opinion that much. We're here to have a dialogue. I could be wrong, but I'm not going to flame the hate on Twitter. You don't find us there. So anyway, his five biggest problems with Dune, and I don't necessarily disagree, but again, our fans and users, they know the truth because they identified a plot hole, and I'm going to show it to you, and you're going to go, oh my gosh, these people are brilliant. Come here to Our Reviews Will Kill You for some brilliant, brilliant dialogue and conversation. <laughs> And it's not all coming for me, folks. I promise you. So five biggest problems here. And uh, let's go with the emotional connection does not connect. This is the precise thing that I was talking about 
in my previous review of like what was bothering me about Dune Part 2. And I think it's more of a Denis Villeneuve problem than it is anything else. His movies are cold and sterile. I watched Prisoners. I like Prisoners. But I don't necessarily feel emotionally connected to it. Uh, Blade Runner 2049, I do not feel emotionally connected to it whatsoever. And Sicario, are you supposed to feel connected to what goes on there? I just I just don't see it. So I think that's more of a director issue. Arrival, it has a little bit of an emotional ring to it, but I definitely didn't feel connected to it. The beautiful movies, very well done, but there's something missing, and I think it's a little hard. So let's keep going. Timothy and Chalamet and Zendaya do their best. I don't... Uh, you know, Timothy Chalamet, which I did not give him enough credit for. The man has some bass in his huevos. He brought it. He definitely had a, a level that I have never seen from him before, and I've seen him in a handful of things. And this, he when he's yelling at the Fremen, especially in their own language, I thought he actually brought it. He did a pretty good job. Uh, Zendaya was doing the best uh, bitch face she possibly could bring, and, and I think she was told to do that. So I can't necessarily blame her for that, although she has the same sour puss she had in Spider-Man, which is the same sour puss I think I've seen in other movies. So you tell me. Maybe I'm wrong. But they don't have the same natural chemistry as the Game of Thrones people. You know, Jon Snow and Daenerys, or Jon Snow and Ygritte, who, you know... Ended up getting married, right? You can't count that. <laughs> so I thought they were good, but not that good. <laughs> there are too many famous people in these movies. I will 100% say um, <laughs> we have Drax the Destroyer, Aquaman, Thanos, Moon Knight, Poe Dameron, Black Widow's sister, Christopher Walken, Zendaya, and on and on. A few celebrities are fine, but this is too many. Okay, Fair enough. I was a little pulled out of it when I saw, um, who did I see that? Pull? Oh, when, <laughs> when I saw Aquaman in this, he's the one who stands out like a sore thumb. Jason Momo stands out like a sore thumb because if he's going to be continued in the rest of the mo in any future movies, he's a lot of heavy lifting in the acting department to do. And I just saw Aquaman too, and that is not a good movie, and he is not good in it. So, um, him just being himself, probably not good enough. Christopher Walken kind of just dialed it in. I, he didn't have a lot of lines, and I, you know, I love Christopher Walken, but not his best stuff. So, okay, let's go on. It's too long and too rushed at the same time, and it ends too abruptly. Okay, I mean... If you watch the the David Lynch one, it ends in a montage. So it's, it's kind of how the book goes. It is what it is. And the Harkonnens are just cartoon villains now. I will tend to disagree with that one. Gonna say that uh, whoever that Elvis guy, Austin, Dustin, something or other, I don't know what his name is. You think I would know the actor's name, but I don't. Uh, but Fade Rautha, he actually, I thought his... He was he, he did a very, very good job. He was able to pick up on Stella and Skarsgård's accent exceptionally well. And I felt like he, they were part of the same family. And he really just, he kind of nailed it. Now, having him kill people in every single scene was a little ridiculous. But I still thought he was, ve he was very good. I really enjoyed it. And look, you know, we're talking about Dune and we're holding it to a higher standard. And guess what? We're not talking about Zack Snyder, who was just on JRE, yucking it up with Joe Rogan, talking about Rebel Moon. Rebel Moon is can't even wipe Dune's behind, as far as I'm concerned. Rebel Moon is an embarrassment compared to this. So we're holding it to the highest of standards. We want better cinema, and I, and I'm not. I'm still saying I like the movie. But here's the point that I wanted to make because our fans brought it to you here first. This is this is just killer, and I I, I can't I, I cannot illustrate enough. Let me see if I can actually read oop, the person's handle. Uh, they, they don't have um, the greatest handle. User C one seven G G nine E M T six T. Thank you very much for for this comment. 
What's the point of marrying Irulan if you're going to kill everyone who opposes you anyway? I wouldn't consider this an adaptation. Is more like a movie based on the book. Villanuevo, uh, Villanu uh, destroyed both timelines and characters equally. Now, I don't, now, I don't know that he dis destroyed it, and, and that's okay. It's still a, a, a very solid opinion. Uh, just like uh, this other user says, uh, Zendaya is by far the weakest part of Dune 2. She plays Mary Jane in every role, and, and her constant grimace frown is annoying. Nothing like the novel, which is true. Why? So if you think about the end of the movie, what you have is um, you have Timothy Chalamet saying basically to the Emperor, I will kill all of you and your entire bloodline if you do not allow me to marry your daughter and become the Emperor and you will step down and play, pledge fealty to me. So he makes a big deal about marrying her. And then in the book, the great houses don't fight him. They say you have the whole point of marrying her is to have a legitimate claim to the throne. Well, when he transmits that message through Gurney, Gurney says to him, uh, yeah, they're not going to accept that. And then Timothy Chalamet tells the Fremen, go really, you know, go have at it, boys. Go get them, boys. And that defeats the entire purpose of him. And then he could have just been like, well, then I will just kill the Emperor and kill Princess Urlan, and I'll go get Chani back, and we'll all be good. So basically, this entire marriage of convenience is, is moot. The point is unnecessary. There's no reason to it. See, in the book, it makes more sense because it's almost a mirror of what his father never did. The first Duke Leto was not married to to uh, Lady Jessica. Lady Jessica was his concubine, and he left open his ability to marry because he might want to, you know, make some sort of alliance or ascend to the throne or something like that. He was never able to do that because of the Harkonnen betrayal and, and the betrayal by the Emperor. The, and at the end of the book. Uh, Lady Jessica says something to Chani, like they may, he may be, you know, um, Paul may be marrying Princess Urulan, but she will never bear any of his children. Her bloodline will not continue. He will be, uh, she said, who, what really matters is the concubines who will be the wives because they will bear the children, they will raise the children. So Chani will have a bloodline to care after. And she's okay with that. That's that's the compromise that he makes. It's not that he's going to marry Princess Urulan and then have heirs with her. It's, I'm taking the throne, and you will not have my children. He, he's sacrificing, and she's sacrificing. And and it's a mirror image of the relationship that his father had with his, with his mother. And this defeats everything. There's no point to it. You might as well just kill them anyway. All he would have had to do was... Put all his atomics on all the spice things and been like, well, don't need to marry you, Emperor or Emperor's daughter. I could just kill all you anyway. There's no point to even having a conversation here because the rest of the ha great houses don't agree with my decision. So that's a giant plot hole as far as I'm concerned. And you guys pointed it out first. I knew there was something gnawing in the back of my head about this that didn't make any sense. So it defeats the book, and I get it. It's it's really like their own adaptation, and maybe he's trying to make more drama for the next the next movie. Doom Messiah didn't need that kind of drama because it takes away all of the providence that Shani had over her own body and her own autonomy. Because there's a whole very interesting plot line between Urulan, Princess Urulan, and Shani in that third book, and or in the second book, really. It'll be the third movie, second book. And they're taking away all of her ability to make any decisions because they're just going to make it like, well, she got to win back her man or some nonsense. So you weakened a character in order to make her a girl boss. And that's pretty silly. So let me know what your thoughts are. Again, thank you. I read every comment. We, we talk about it. You guys are killing it. You know, and it, it's this is the reason why I do these videos because we have great dialogue, we have great conversation here. Thank you so much to everybody who contributes, but this one just took the cake for me. 
So I think that's an amazing point. I really appreciate it. You can catch our live stream here on uh, YouTube. It's a uh, We start the podcast Friday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a good time. Promise you'll enjoy it. And uh, we do a bunch of other stuff. We release a bunch of shorts, 10-second shorts. We review a whole ton of stuff. You guys will enjoy them. You can also join the channel. You can super chat us. Or for as little as $1, you can keep a starving noob noob from starving. That's $12 a year. That's like two cappuccino, not cappuccinos, two Starbucks drinks a year. You can help support the channel. Help us keep doing what we're doing. Every little bit helps. Like and subscribe, comment, share, all of the above. We love all y'all, but I am on to the next one. Mm -hmm.